I think so. Yeah, it's following me. So thank you very much, Orlando, um, uh, first for the introduction, but second of all, uh, for the pleasure to be here at uh, UBC. And, and um, uh, some of you have been to other universities and some of you haven't, but you're just in such a special environment uh, here at BPI um, uh, and doing the work you're doing, multidisciplinary, scientific, uh, and engineering work. Uh, and I'm sure you all know that in some way or another, but I hear the word magic uh, used a lot uh, at the conferences that, um, uh, that uh, Orlando organized a couple of weeks ago of alumni that have been here through the years. So um, you guys are so lucky. Uh, so this presentation is called 2020 is not 2010, uh, creating a competitive advantage in Canada's bioeconomy. Uh, you can extend that to 2022. Um, uh, and it's an introductory presentation to you, so I hope to make a, a few more over the course of the next few months, uh, and I hope you can join me. Uh, so this is, uh, I've got to do a little plug, uh, this is my university uh, in Montreal, the Université de Montréal, so the largest French language university uh, in, uh, in the Americas, so that includes South America. Uh, but of course, it's French language, so it's not as well known um, as, uh, as UBC, for example, uh, in many places. It's essentially bilingual at the graduate level, but it is uh, unknown to many. Uh, Canada's second largest university with 70,000 students um, and uh, 20,000 graduate students in there, and only, I would say, uh, compared to UBC, 9,000 international students. Uh, so, uh, uh, Nick, the engineering school, so in the French tradition, the engineering school, Polytechnique, and the business school, HSA, are independent, even if they're on the same campus and um, uh, they have separate budgets, uh, independent means. Uh, it's in the heart of Montreal. There is the, um, the main building uh, right there, uh, and, uh, and the new building, new green building in front of it. And across that mountain behind there, uh, you see downtown Montreal. The chemical engineering department, uh, where 29 faculty, 100 uh, PhDs, 50 uh, each uh, MSc is a professional and research, so the 150 divided by 30 is about five graduate students per um, faculty uh, in the department. So we're quite active. And the same stuff that Orlando uh, kindly introduced me with uh, a long time ago. I graduated from um, uh, McGill and already doing black liquor uh, gasification. And then I sat in the same desk and went from one company to another as uh, consolidation happened. Uh, doing strategic and process environmental uh, consulting, uh, I would say. And uh, during this part of it, it was a company called H.A. Simons, uh, which is at that time Vancouver head office. And I was coming out uh, every few weeks to Vancouver and absolutely fell in love uh, with your uh, wonderful city. A great view except the mountains and the ocean get in the way. Um, uh, and then left all that, cut my salary in half. Uh, and went back to university, and that was the best professional decision I've ever made in my life, to be honest, um, to take up this chair in design engineering. So I don't do research uh, per se, but I do design research, which is the application of, um, of tools uh, to, um, for making decisions around design. Uh, at the same time, um, actually two companies, but this was the one I'm going to uh, uh, talk about. It's a, a consulting company, a strategic consulting company, uh, for industry, and as uh, Orlando introduced, uh, as germane to the presentation I'm going to make today. So really, I'm thrilled to be here um, this semester. Thank you very much, Orlando, who's an amazing host. There are lots of coffees and discussion about all kinds of stuff. And I'd like to drink coffee with you, too. So this is an open invitation. Uh, I've had a coffee with Emily as well. Um, uh, uh, I'd like to you know, make linkages and collaboration if I can. What do I do? I'll kind of do this on an ad hoc basis through the presentation a little bit uh, in my research, but the goal of today is to talk about this big, uh, it's a largely non-technical presentation, this big picture of what is influencing uh, our Canadian bioeconomy and the global bioeconomy for that matter. So, but what do I do? I do uh, product and process uh, design, um, and I apply it only for the forest bioeconomy. And when I was a consultant with H.A. Simons, they do pulp and paper, so it's, it's really been design and simulation and modeling uh, all the way through my career and by luck or, um, uh, or something else, I've, I've really just kept building on that competency in my career. And then when you get fancy, uh, it's called process integration, process systems engineering, where process integration comes from the design uh, 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 heritage, if you want, to thermal pinch analysis uh, and other design tools. 
and process systems analysis, which comes from optimization and control largely. And these two things have got married. Uh, and, um, uh, and how I distinguish my research program from others is I combine all those tools. I try to solve problems with the combination of tools. And that's sort of the theme of what we're talking about today, by the way. Um, and um, increasingly, um, digitalization. So two kinds of digitalization people, and I'm one of the two, uh, which uh, people who used to do systems engineering are, are evolving into digitalization. That makes us weak uh, in some areas that are related to the mathematics in particular, and strong in other matters, because uh, we have gray box models, and that has something to do with reality and the way things really work. So that's what we, uh, we pull up our, um, our A. So the talk today is really about this link between Invertis in the real world and uh, the sort of work we do uh, at, in the university in my research program. So let's jump into then the context of the presentation today. Um, so industry is all about uh, delivering. It's all about having discipline. So uh, you know, most companies today, I would say, have established what their uh, program or strategy is going to be for the bioeconomy. And now they've got to stick to the knitting. They've got to stay focused. They've got to stay disciplined. And they've got to deliver it. And you're, in fact, seeing a number of companies today, forestry companies, that have embarked on the bioeconomy, and they're kind of changing their mind because they want to see where, where the return on that investment is. Uh, so we've seen Omtar disband their biomaterials group uh, in the last couple of years, um, and you're feeling pressure in a number of companies, even Brazilian companies, uh, to deliver on the promise of their investments that they've made until now. So you've got this dilemma of sticking to the knitting while the risks are really big. You know, I don't know how many of you read Biofuels Digest uh, every morning when you wake up like I do, but that's the, the go-to place, uh, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, two businesses are popping up every month, and one's going out of business every month. Um, and certainly the way we're thinking about the bioeconomy is changing uh, very rapidly on an ongoing basis. So um, you've got these new innovations and products, especially showing up on the horizon. Um, and at the same time, and more subtle, uh, Policies are changing. Countries are, it comes into vogue and goes out of vogue. Canada doesn't have a bioeconomy strategy yet. We should. Um, right to member parliament. Uh, and, um, uh, and as well in my area, systems analytics are changing. And, and that is influencing the way companies are seeing their bioeconomy strategies because we're doing fancier analytics if you want. So why now for this presentation changed? Um, uh, here's a couple of examples, GHG mission targets, uh, circular bioeconomy, industry 4.0, industry approach to the bioeconomy. You've all heard about, of course. Uh, and let's go one step down on each one with a couple of points, and then let's go even further in this presentation. So, um, you know, GHG emission reduction targets, 40% or something like that, is what we want to do in Canada relative to the Paris Accord. And if you look at what um, Clean BC and uh, others are doing, but especially BC, uh, way to go. Um, uh, all of the policy being put in place today is geared towards biofuels and geared towards using large quantities of biomass for reducing our GHG emissions, uh, you know, as much as the, uh, the biomass story is concerned. But now you've got this new thing on the horizon coming out. Uh, countries are promising it, regions are promising it, uh, cities are promising it, companies are promising it, and facilities are promising it, and that's called net zero GHG emissions. Um, and that's a good thing. Whether we get there or not is another question, but that's a good thing. Uh, the circular economy, well, the, you know, I like to say, do we really care about circularity? And we do, of course, but I say it because if we're 90% 10% circular because we're measuring circularity now um, as a metric, we don't really care. We care if we reduce our impact, but it's a strategy. And so I say we don't really care about circularity because we do care about it as a strategy but let's not go too far on that. And the big question is, how will policy come into play with regards to circularity? And um, in policy, we like to talk about sticks, and I hope it's a carrot approach as opposed to a stick approach for exactly that simple reason. Industry 4.0 and digitalization. Well, this is going to change everything. We all agree. Uh, we just don't know what it is. And industry, um, uh, certainly in the heavy industries, it's a complicated thing. Uh, and I'm certainly morphing my research program in that uh, direction. Uh, but if, if, you're, uh, if you're in medical or if you're on the internet, uh, on a power grid, the data are pretty clean. And you, you can really 
follow them along. But in, in, in a pulp and paper mill or future biorefinery, uh, the data are dirty, they're uncertain, they're sparse, you don't have enough of them. Uh, and so it's going to happen, but it's going to happen over the next few decades. It's not happening now. We're looking at it in an opportunistic way in the industry today. How do we make some money out of this stuff? Uh, but we're not really looking at it holistically towards the autonomous mill, except in a few cases by large companies like Valmet and others. So over the period of the bioeconomy, um, we're going to come about, I do believe, to say digitalization is an imperative. We have to have it for being competitive in the longer term. So, um, you know, the fourth thing I'd like to bring into context uh, in the introduction here is uh, the industry approach. So 2010 and 2022, um, I was there in 2010 and, and working with companies about their bio economy and what they should do. And it's a lot different. Now. People are a lot more sophisticated uh, as to what they're um, thinking about. And the new kid on the block uh, here is that uh, now you're beginning to see, especially for or quality biomass for forest residues and things, you're beginning to see uh, competition uh, for biofuels in particular, and if the petroleum companies get that game as they're threatening to do uh, when we run out of uh, lipid uh, type uh, feedstocks, uh, then there's going to be competition out there in, in, the, in the regions for biomass. And that's going to become a big deal because forestry companies, the um, the profits of the largest, the world's largest forestry companies, um, uh, I'm sorry, the revenues of the world's largest forestry companies is smaller than the profits of the world's largest petrochemical companies and, uh, and uh, petroleum companies. So let's go back to this new kid on the block here. I want to underline that because this is what's the difference in the last years, year or two. Uh, this fellow here, um, his name is Larry Fink. Uh, I wouldn't smile um, at his name at all. He's a, a very powerful uh, person. Uh, he is the uh, CEO, President CEO of a company called BlackRock, which is a, um, an assets manager. Uh, and they have just $10 trillion in assets under management. So this is what the, the world's largest asset management company they invest. And he sends out a letter every January. And this is his letter of this year. He says, we focus on sustainability, not because we're environmentalists, but because we're capitalists and fiduciaries to our clients, they invest, with, they take that job responsibly. Here's the good news. There has been a tectonic shift of capital. That means a lot uh, of capital moving towards sustainable investing. So we've all heard about uh, ethical um, mutual funds and things like that. But this is finally, I would say, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and other things have been around a long time. But this is finally really taking hold, and that matters. Um, he says, four sided companies across a wide range of carbon intensive sectors are really changing their businesses. They're taking it seriously. And that's going to be what drives a lot of decarbonization. And this is the nice one. Uh, we believe that companies uh, leading the transition present a vital investment opportunity. He's going to put his money there, some of that $10 trillion, uh, for our clients and driving capital towards these phoenixes. That's a good thing. Uh, uh, will be essential to retrieving that, and he makes reference to a net zero world. So this is really good news. Uh, if you come, I'm a social democrat, just so you know, I can be clear. Uh, but um, I do believe in capitalism and the impact it has on industry and on our society. So with that as a background, uh, two objectives of the presentation. Number one is to capture some barriers into emerging trends that are impacting the bioeconomy. Uh, in Canada and around the world, and it should be considered by companies and governments, okay? Um, and one at a time, the, the trends are important. If we talk about circularity, well, we, we can do a lot of work in circularity, and if we talk about net zero, we can do a lot of work in uh, net zero, but if you take them all together, it's a really complicated landscape, and that, if you leave today saying that you agree with that statement, my work is done here. Um, uh, and but this is the reality that companies are facing as they decide they're moving towards the bioeconomy. It's a big deal. So um, how, though, can we turn this challenge into a positive, I think, is, is the theme, too. How can these trends capture unique competitive advantage for those companies that grab the bull by the horns and move forward? Uh, and I've got a little idea at the end that I've I got up on a soapbox about recently. And I'm going to throw that out there. 
So uh, how are we going to talk about that? So first we'll start with some inspiration from Europe, because uh, Europe, um, as the bioeconomy leader, and then uh, some workshops we did, uh, including one of them here at Innovation uh, in Berlin. Um, and then we'll talk about some seven trends, and then finally um, some take-home messages. So let's get going on that. So um, a new bioeconomy strategy for sustainable Europe uh, those of you who follow and breathe this stuff uh, know that that's out there. And you've got two big players in Europe that are different here. Uh, one is support for investment, and the other one um, in R&D and, and development, and the other one is, is policy. And these are really big numbers. Um, uh, so uh, 2013 to 2020, they have something called Horizon 2020 with a budget the size of uh, um, the GDP of small countries. And in there, you had uh, 4 billion or so euros um, for BBI, which is the bio-based uh, industries initiatives. And that's just been renewed uh, with something called CBE, uh, the um, Circular Bio-Based Europe, and that goes through to 2027. And they have JU listed after those things, and that stands for Joint Undertaking, and it's a public-private partnership is the way that they do the support. And they, they really look at low TRL, technology readiness levels, middle and then high, and they support those. And right from the beginning, though, you need the value chain and the value chain partners in place. Or you don't, you don't get over the line, you don't begin to qualify. That's a really important point, because that's what we do very poorly in North America. That's, I would say, one of our largest competitive disadvantages in North America, and I'm gonna come back to that point. So for this new program, they wanna scale up and strengthen, uh, they wanna rapidly deploy, they wanna do all those things we need to do to have a bioeconomy. And if you look at what they're, this is 2018 numbers here, um, and it depends how you define these things. So I'm a little suspicious and I haven't dug in to be able to tell you the answer, but they say 2 trillion euros a year of turnover. Um, 18 million people are employed. Value added of 621 billion over 2 uh, trillion. That's a pretty good number. And they're saying it's 4.2% of the GDP of Europe. Now that's pretty good, uh, very impressive. And of course, they've got to look forward to justify a new program and you can hire a whole bunch more people. I think we need to refer to these data uh, in the Canadian context. I think we need to say that there is potential. We, we can do much better than 4.2% uh, um, of the GDP. Now let's go to that second uh, part, which is about barriers uh, and these workshops. So um, they ended just before uh, COVID, thank you. Uh, we, um, we held um, some workshops across Canada, and the goal of the workshops was to address barriers. So um, value chain gaps, um, that had been identified actually by FP Innovations and uh, a person I'm a great fan of, uh, and many of you know, Trevor Stuthridge. Um, uh, and we went further than that to say, well, under those gaps, what are the main attributes or characteristics that need to be addressed um, and uh, in order to catalyze the, the value chain uh, of the bioeconomy? So we had these uh, workshops, six of them, and they were two-day workshops. Uh, they were substantial uh, in five cities. Uh, guess which of the cities was in twice? Sarnia, surprise. Um, but um, 142 participants, two kinds of participants. One are people who are in the value chain, so people who produce things. They add value um, as you go through uh, by ch exchanging mass and energy. Uh, and there are anchor firms and ultimate market pull firms from the beginning of the value chain through towards the end of the value chain. And I'll talk more about that later because it's important. And then you had all these other people, um, technology developers and cluster service providers and government, um, and they're different. They don't exchange mass and energy. They offer services to the value chain, and that's important too. So we had these 142 participants. Um, there were a few academics, but uh, not uh, almost none. Uh, so they invented value chains, and 22 were conceived over these six uh, um, um, uh, workshops and um, the five value chain gaps and the attributes were sort of measured against them. Uh, so um, then at the end we put up all the attributes and they could put stickers on them. So um, they could say that which one is the most important, the least important, and which one was, well you should have been more, less ambiguous about how you expressed what that means. Um, and so it was you know, difficult to interpret it, but uh, here are the five value chain gaps. Uh, so you have the gap, and then let's find the solutions to those attributes. So that was a requirement too. 
So one is market production imbalance. That means we make a lot of NCC or CNC, but nobody wants to buy it yet. Or we make a little bit of biofuel, but we can't really control the market yet with that amount compared to a, a petroleum company. Uh, then waste stream innovation. So you know, if you take a tree, uh, Mother Nature made it. It's beautiful. It has beautiful chemicals in it. To ask this guy uh, and that uh, pr a gal, uh, but um, when you take out the core of that, you're left with something that's even more heterogeneous. And as you go on, even more heterogeneous uh, and more difficult to find value in, it, or its functionality is more difficult to sell in the marketplace. Something that um, BPI, like nobody else does, is second transformation. So we do the first transformation, we fractionate our biomass, or we pull something out of a, a pulp process, um, and then we go on to add value. And this is going to be, I believe, the key to success. Um, so you're, you're doing the right stuff uh, here. And uh, the business side, we can't forget that. We, we need to, in some way, reinvent. Uh, trees don't walk, and you can't pump them. Uh, so the economies of scale are different for biorefineries. Uh, and we even need to look at different business models, and I'll talk very briefly, uh, actually, about that later, too. And this is potential barriers. That's everything else. Things like change management, those culture changes we need in, 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 in uh, forest products companies and things like that. So um, I'll give you the top six. Uh, so you know you had the most and the least and the most ambiguous, so it wasn't obvious. Talk about the least, the six ones that came up to the top. And all I want you to get out of this really is well, that's a pretty sophisticated bunch of attributes uh, and solutions. So the first one is um, we don't have enough innovation strategy, open innovation, and we need a portal uh, to use open innovation to, to bring really good ideas uh, to bear. This one here said, well, you know, we use a lot of energy. We spend a lot the, the middle part, the process, that's a lot of fun to develop. You guys are doing that, but apparently at the end of the day, we need to sell a product. We need to purify it. Um, and we need to make sure that it can be certified in the marketplace and achieve its value proposal. So um, we should spend more time looking at separation and purification of whatever it is we're making. Um, and industrial symbiosis. So uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that in the presentation. But uh, uh, the idea that the background, the environment around the biorefinery strategy is really important to its economic and sustainability. Number four, uh, and you can see the VC gap is there, and then the, um, the particular attribute, is technology development for differentiated bioproducts. Uh, uh, and so um, this is exactly what you guys are doing, uh, is to look at um, products that may be manufactured at smaller volumes, but have more stringent specifications in order to have their value proposal in the industry. And this is a big deal. We do a lot of work on this in my research group because if you make a commodity, it's like making Big Macs. You, you, Big Macs, you push, you make them, lunch is coming, so you make a whole bunch of Big Macs and you push them out to the marketplace. But if you're in a differentiated added value product, you wait for the order to come in. It's called make to order, uh, and you need, uh, maybe you're going to have different specifications for your different products, and you've got to get it to your customer uh, just in time. And so this is uh, worth a whole lot more money. This is a trend. Uh, actually um, in um, the chemical processing industries um, and uh, a modular uh, production of added value products. An experience curve is really big in, in the bioeconomy, eh? and I was surprised uh, that this came out of uh, the, um, the workshops. Um, it says that once we have our first commercial installation, not nine times out of 10, but 10 times out of 10, the overall production cost and operating cost is about a or much less than a half in 10 times out of 10. It's called the experience curve. So if I'm going to take the risk and put in the first implementation, how do I account for the fact that by the nth implementation, I'm not very competitive anymore? Um, and so we have two strategies that are for commodity or value, uh, depending on the technology in place. And so the number six out of the six is uh, create market demand. And so um, the idea of, of getting people involved at that value chain level like they do in Europe is one. And, uh, and for um, green policy, so for the government to say, well, we need to put lignin into roads so we can um, pay our contractors maybe to them while we're developing other added value, more added value uh, products. So, you know, this 
brings to mind the idea of something called the business and innovation ecosystem, something that we really need in Canada. This is going to be my eureka moment in the presentation, is to come back to this. And um, Canada uh, has a poor forest product industry on a global, we have some big forestry companies, but if you benchmark them on a global level, uh, they're not very big. And we think poor because we have had some bad years. We've had a lot of good years. Don't let anyone tell you that the forest products industry is not making money. Uh, and I would say 15 years now, we've been making money. The debt equity of our forestry companies has come way down. Um, but we think poor. We're still saying, well, next year it's going to be really bad or the year after. So I'm not talking about newsprints or printing and writing papers, but I'm talking about uh, board and, and tissue and, and, um, and uh, other uh, segments. Okay, so we've got the idea of barriers, and we've got the idea that really smart people from that, all services and value chain people, and they came up with these um, attributes. Uh, we had, I think, 32 attributes in total, um, and, and they were really smart uh, attributes. So we kind of know what the problems are. Now, superimpose on that um, the idea that we've got things that are changing out there. So here are the um, seven trends that we've identified, uh, uh, and I worked a lot on these with um, Luana Despesel, uh, who has been um, uh, in exchanging a lot with the BPI. She was a MyTax postdoc. Um, industrial symbiosis, uh, anchor companies, feedstock flexibility, uh, circular economy and climate change, digitalization, distributed value chains, and this BIE, the Eureka moment. So um, uh, I'm going to talk just about three of them today because we're going to run out of time, but I'll pass quickly through the others and, and just put a few words into play on them uh, here. And, and to give you an idea of the research program uh, that I have at, um, at Polytechnic, uh, we work on design methods. So. Um, uh, a student who's just finishing now on something we call large block analysis where we look at risk uh, and we look at relative costs for technologies at different TRLs with different levels of optimism in the information we have on them and it recognizes that it's the innovators that develop these technologies. We can't go to um, Peters and Timmerhaus and use the factors in there for, to estimate the capital costs of these technologies. Um, uh, second student is working on, um, we're working with uh, NR Can Can Meta on, they have a software called iBioRef, um, and so we're testing it out and doing uh, case studies uh, in, in one study, in one um, uh, graduate student. Another one is to look at site-wide energy optimization, uh, and we designed, it's a new method, it's the state-of-the-art method, did I say that, uh, that looks at energy degra degradation across process units. So the the usual approach, uh, what we call pinch analysis, looks at the heat exchange network and optimizes that. Well, we're looking at energy degradation, second law, across unit operations, because we want to redesign those as we go to zero uh, emissions and we electrify and we put in state-of-the-art membranes in our separation processes in the bioeconomy. Uh, here I have a student um, who's looking, we're working with Texas A&M University uh, and, um, and looking at uh, optimizing um, the economic model for different backgrounds for how um, biorefineries might integrate uh, into those backgrounds. Uh, here I have a student, we're working with Université Laval in this case, um, on um, biohubs. So what do we do over here um, to do a primary transformation of our wood, considering both a biorefinery and the incumbent forestry sector. And then um, uh, Yasaman is looking at flexibility. So if we take municipal, agricultural, or um, forest feedstocks, how would we dry and redimension that to go into a gasification unit? And then how might we put innovation, uh, start to couple those things if we have two kinds of biomass and still have the quality and the stability, uh, variability is the enemy of continuous processing. So you're getting the idea here. Um, uh, we're doing some work relative to strategies on net zero. Uh, here, Emily's coming uh, in a few weeks' time as she's looking at data, how we remove noise, reconcile data, put it in operating regimes, and try to get a database uh, useful for digitalization in a complicated real mill. Um, that gives you an idea of the sorts of things we do in the program and how it relates to uh, these trends. So for each one of those, we 
we dissected it in this way, and we talked about it a long time before we arrived here, and we've gone and talked to forestry companies in and around it. So I'm only going to do three examples and do a survey of the rest. Uh, how am I doing on time? Perfect. Um, uh, so we talk about the background or, or, you know, what is the usual definition? And then we say, well, how does this work in the bioeconomy? Because it's one thing to say circular economy is a good thing. We like sustainability. Well, we got that. But then how does it manifest for the bioeconomy? So how do we turn that into an advantage? And then let's look out there for some concretizing examples. So we, even though this is sort of casting forward stuff, um, we did this systematically and we've um, litmus tested it with companies. So in the case of industrial symbiosis, I won't go through this for the three that, that I show, but just this one, um, we do this definition. Uh, we talk about BSF at Verbund, who some of you may know about, Verbund. Um, industrial symbiosis, how do we adapt that for the bioeconomy? What's unique about it? The benefits we might have if we do that, and uh, an example. So. Um, you know, uh, uh, those of you who might work in this, um, in industrial symbiosis, Chertow is the, uh, the reference text if you want, and it's about trading materials, uh, usually at a geographic proximity, so on an industrial site, and how do I take my waste, maybe I transform it a little bit and, and make it a feedstock for somebody else's process. So that's what it is broadly, and, and um, to talk about Kallenberg, that's the first classical uh, example of industrial symbiosis, and um, you know, they start with cogeneration, and they kind of grew up over time uh, uh, opportunistically, and that's the way these things generally happen. And in the bioeconomy, we're looking at designing that. So it's not going to, we're going to design it, but it's not going to happen the way we think because that's not the way business works. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, how we start with cogeneration because we have steam and we have power, and we have then cheap land uh, in and around it, and then we can help out each other uh, in terms of... Um, uh, a site. It's a great example of social democracy. Um, so what's new with the bioeconomy? Well, um, here's a couple of things that were identified in those um, cross Canada uh, tours. Uh, the first one is um, if we have industrial symbiosis, if we start to work together, well, I, I can make a new bioproduct. And I want to take it to my, I want to go to market with what we say. Uh, eventually, but for now, I, I'm not ready to go to market, and I'm really having trouble finding people who will test my product and who will identify its, um, uh, the, its value proposal, its characteristics, and then to use it, and then to say, well, what am I offsetting in terms of the fossil-based or other product, and so what's it worth? So, well, we can work together to do that, and then the extension of that is to, um, to understand that value proposal in the marketplace, and then the extension of that is well, why don't we share the pain and the gain? Why don't we make business models that use exchange data, digitalization, that's becoming part of how we work in value chains? And why don't we um, use that information to create business models that let us survive in the long term? Uh, this works a little bit, I'm only going to say in Europe, but it doesn't work at all in North America. It's a foreign concept. So let's uh, go through those um, a little bit more with an example. VASF they have, I don't know, six or seven sites around the world. The biggest ones are in, in Germany. And there are cities, and they say, this is off their website. Um, I should have put a reference there. Oh, I did, www. Um, our unique Verbund concept is one of VASF's greatest strengths. The driving principle of the Verbund concept is to add value through the efficient use of resources at our Verbund sites production plants, energy and material flows, logistics, and site infrastructure are all integrated. This is important because we have reference to mass and energy, and then we also have um, reference to systems that support that exchange. Okay, so here's a picture and some numbers around them, uh, super impressive. And BASF, we know, is a leader in the bioeconomy, don't we? So, okay, so this is uh, also, this is from now a presentation. Um, uh, so not the website, bad reference, plagiarized. Uh, but um, uh, they say BS dri BSF drivers for adapting to the bioeconomy. They go through a bunch of things and they say enabling molecules not accessible via fossil routes. And of course, that makes sense. But how do we do that in a rational way that is business sensible? And so they put up this, and I, I love it. Um, it's simple and yet it's expressive. We have a fossil here and we have biomass here. 
And here we do some sign of, sort of um, a drop-in building block, and we build it into the fossil route. This is the way most uh, petroleum companies or specialty chemical companies think about the bioeconomy. And here we have uh, making dedicated products is what they call it there. And, and they're right here, and I, and I like this slide of theirs too. Uh, this is uh, um, fossil feedstock-based chemical process. This is renewables-based chemical process. And at the top it says, fossil feedstocks remain backbone. Renewables provide new opportunities. So I love that because I followed UPM, uh, the Bio4 company, this big Finnish company that is certainly, uh, along with Sora Enzo, the global leader in the bioeconomy. And they said something exactly analogous to that in the early 2000s as they rebranded themselves the Bio4 company. And they said, well, we're going to make some biofuels here, but we're core business people because they don't want to scare away the investors, of course. But today, a third of their revenues come from bio products. So BASF, let there be no doubt, they're on the way. And industrial symbiosis is going to play a very important part of that. And they have some projects that I'm not talking about here that are into digitalization and industrial symbiosis in a heavy way. So let's go on to those more subtle aspects of what this means to the bioeconomy that I talked about, which is establishing the value proposal. So um, if you go into a room and you're a pulp and paper company, you're probably not wearing a tie, um, and you're probably just coming in by yourself with your hand in your pocket. And if you're meeting up with a big chemical or petrochemical company, there's probably three people with ties and four lawyers behind them. It's that there are big cultural differences between industry sectors. And the first thing those sophisticated people are doing, because chemical po companies for a long time have made their business models on adding value. Add a methyl group, create a new functionality, make a lot of money. So the first thing you do is market pricing. Well, if we don't buy your biomaterial, are you going to burn it in a boiler? So the market pricing thing is all about, well, what does it cost to produce and deliver the bioproduct versus what's the value to the off-taker? And this North American problem, I'm going to call it that, that we have is the off-taker or the ultimate market pull is coming for somebody who sits on a throne and says, give it to me 20 cheaper for a better or equal to quality. And we're not getting together as we do much better, still not perfectly in Europe. And that's a big deal. So what does that mean, really? Um, and so we do a lot of work in this area in, in Vertus. Uh, for companies. So here's our forestry company, and they're putting in their um, uh, biorefinery, and it's integrating into their mill. So it's, a, it's not a simple model. And then, so they've got a capex and an opex, and they're looking at developing a biorefinery. Then they've got these other costs associated, you know, about minimum selling price, include all that other things. And then you've got some kind of a margin to reach, you know, say 20% internal rate of return. Okay, so we've got some numbers there. And now you've got your off ticker. You come in, you meet them, and you don't know what this is. So you've got um, uh, value to the potential off -tier. You can see that highest bar there. Um, the downs, then you've got this lower bar, which is your room for negotiation. Um, so that value to them is corresponding in some way to this bar. And then you've got the downside margin. So I can actually lower my 20% return, but I can't go into negative territory. I'm going to lose money every unit that I make. So um, if we can identify that, then the question is, how should we share the difference? And this is a big deal. It's difficult, uh, but we have examples. Uh, and I talk about uh, Flambeau River, who used to sell their red liquor to, who does sell their red liquor to um, DuPont to make xylitol. So their red liquor has xylose in it, and they make xylitol. And they've twice gone out of business because they are ratcheted down on their price uh, for the raw material to the point where the mill has trouble surviving economically. And they come back. Um, so um, what's new in the bioeconomy here then is the idea that you have people working together and they in some ways work as, this is not collusion, they some ways work as an, a vertically integrated company. And they're helping each other out. And you can go as far as the business model and you can share the pain and share the gain. Some of it's utopic, some of that might help. Uh, and we can accelerate, and accelerate is really big if you're talking about specialty products. First to market or early to market, let's say, gives you a big competitive advantage. Um, and, um, and to enable this complex uh, enhanced value proposal because 
um, MFC, something that you know a lot about. Well, people who are using MFC find one of the biggest values of MFC is they have less breaks. And that makes a lot of money. So in their core business, they got a lot of that. So we were talking about new products, and we we're talking about less fiber, which all those, but the value come from less breaks going between the press section and the dryer. So here's a simple example. I wish there were some more sophisticated examples. This is in the back here. This is the uh, Resolute uh, Craft Pulp Mill in Saint Felicien, Quebec, and this is the Tundra um, uh, greenhouses, uh, and uh, they make cucumbers and uh, mainly and other things too. Uh, so they capture, they purify the CO2 from here, and they enrich the environment here for the cucumbers, and they get big and beautiful. And they also send them some low-grade energy in the wintertime for heating. So you've got um, a nice, steamy, hot, CO2-enriched uh, atmosphere there. And, um, and some, you know, obviously, um, food has cycles, uh, and um, uh, there's going to be some kind of a, uh, an interesting business model between the two. Now I'm going to apply to these until number six. <coughs> Attract anchor companies. An anchor company is a company that can implement a new technology and operate that new technology through until it's successful. That's my definition. It's near the beginning of the value chain. And the problem is we don't have any of those in Canada. We don't have many head offices in Canada of really big companies that will make the bioeconomy happen. It's a fact. Now, if you look in Canada at our history, if you look at the automotive industry, let's see, Ford, that's a Canadian company. Uh, Toyota, that's a Canadian. No, they're all international companies. If you look at the oil and gas sector, let's see, Shell and uh, Exxon. Uh, well, no, they are too. Uh, and so um, there's nothing wrong. The, that comes out of the National Energy Program and Mr. Trudeau we, after the others were established, and we have uh, also some great OEMs to the automotive industry. Um, so we build out of international companies, and there's nothing wrong with that. And so one of the trends um, I think I'm beginning to see a big recognition of is it doesn't have to be organic, it doesn't have to be Canadian technology, or it doesn't even have to be a Canadian company for that matter. We just need to establish and exploit the bioeconomy for Canada. Biomass feedstocks flexibility. So this has to do with, uh, in a commodity case, um, can we use different kinds of feedstocks for gasification? But it also has to do with, can we use even just one quality of low-grade biomass to create an added value? So these processes are the ones that I have my eye on the most. Circular economy and climate change. Um, here, the big thing about the bioeconomy is they're both based on life cycle analysis. Now, life cycle analysis, it's a characterization. Well, let's characterize, but let's make a decision. As engineers, we use LCA to make decisions. So um, I, until uh, two years ago, I taught a course called life cycle design. And so that's how we use LCA to make design decisions. And that's what we do as engineers is we make decisions. And it's the same thing that we're looking forward as to what we're going to do in the economy. And we're going to design that through to end of life. And we're going to make decisions uh, based on that. Uh, and, and that's what we highlight there. Uh, digitalization. So we're going to begin. Uh, so the, the, the most sensitive parameter in almost every single bioeconomy whose economics we look at is the product price. So there's lots of other variables in there. But the product price is almost invariably the number one sensitivity parameter. And here it's going to begin with the supply chain because we can count widgets and, or volume, and we know where our trucks are and our inventories are. So on the supply chain side, on the product side, Canada's in love with biomass uh, and getting it for a lower cost uh, to the mill gate and digitalization in that context. But it's actually on the product side where we make or lose the economics. OK, so let's jump uh, into these two here. Uh, this is um, uh, Canada's best bioeconomy and bioeconomy cluster. It's um, uh, BIC, uh, Bioinnovation Canada in Sarnia. And you've got um, this industry that was formed after the Second World War, um, a, a petrochemical value chain. They've got pipes underground. Uh, you guys have been to Sarnia, anybody? Don't plan your next vacation around it. Uh, but um, uh, it goes from fossil feedstocks through to fossil products. 
And so they, a long time ago, um, had some very innovative people who I have enormous respect for, and they, they've um, advanced their thinking around this. And, and so here you see this fossil chain at small scale, because it was largely developed after the Second World War, um, and you've got bio-based feedstocks, drop-in feedstocks, and then you've got stuff, well, maybe we can even go more towards the back end of that. And this is very important thinking uh, in terms of um, a value chain. And so then you've got some examples of this is their slide, uh, not mine. And they say that um, I can use it and, and tell their story because it is a great story. So, but the problem here is we don't have too many Sarnias in Canada. We got one. Um, we don't have a lot of post-Second World War small-scale fossil value chains. We have to build on the carbohydrate platform. So we need to find ways to take Canada through to where we're fractionating biomass and then making a bunch of products out of that. That is, so this is great inspiration and this is our, our dream location at the moment in Canada for the bioeconomy at a, at a larger scale. So let's take that thinking a bit further. Here we have the bioeconomy value chain. So it's really the value chain. I just stuck the word bioeconomy in there afterwards. And you've got the idea of the materials going around and around. We've got circularity here. Um, and you've got this yellow stuff going back the other ways. And, and that's information flow. These are the supporting activities that tell us how much we should make and take um, around that, um, that stuff. And this, uh, you know, if we, if we characterize what that means more significantly for the biorefinery, we've got biomass growth. And, and there's a big opportunity for genetics, uh, tree genetics, uh, biomass harvesting. Uh, the way we do harvesting in Canada is the forestry companies manage that. They don't do that. They manage contractors and they spend the least they have to. They're not advanced. If you go to um, Brazil where they own and farm their trees, they have state-of-the-art harvesting and well-managed, optimized harvesting. We don't have that in Canada. Uh, biomass transportation logistics, um, we're pretty good at that in Canada. Then. You know, the way you and I think about it, we've got a primary transformation, raw um, biorefinery material, secondary transformations to added values, integration context, industrial symbiosis, and now this production stuff, which is, this is where the money is made and lost. And then we got the idea from anchor firms through to these guys who sit up there and say 20% cheaper, equal to or better than quality. And then you've got the idea that we're going to go from regional. When we start a bioeconomy, we always a biorefinery. We, we look around us for our friends and we make deals. And then, if you talk to the big companies, what they're doing is looking at the global marketplace and working back to who they should work with or not locally. It's just an opportunity for them locally. These are going to be supply chains, and the big companies think of them in that way. And then in today's context, we need to think about end of life and about how we collect these things and recycle them. So that's getting kind of complicated, isn't it? So here's another look at that. Uh, here's a tree, and, and now we're going to the, the customer there. And this is kind of thinking about the way we usually do it. Um, and there's a guy out there named Michael Porter. And he said, well, every step of this way on that value chain, we should add value. And so it'll cost us something to get there, and we add value, and that should be bigger. And then we have a robust value chain. Uh, so that was a pretty good idea, actually, um, 1990s and quite revolutionary at that time, if you can believe it. And he, he did that really, uh, the support functions that we have for the value chain where we exchange mass and energy. Um, and it, I did it for a company because he was thinking, you know, about um, the automotive sector and OEMs and all these people who have a very disciplined approach to how they add value. So now we're designing these things. The bioeconomy, it's virgin territory. We can do almost anything, and we need to recognize that and have the courage to take some risks. So let's look at this globally um, in terms of the value chain now, some of the ideas we talked about earlier. And then let's put it in a circle for the circular economy. And now let's think about more than one sector involved. The people who went into the bioeconomy will probably involve at least two different sectors as we know them today. So when I you gave some advice to the federal government on policy related to the circular economy a couple of years ago. I said, don't make it, they talk about sectors because that's the way we usually do it. I said, don't make it sector dependent because if we don't trade the sectors, we're not gonna succeed. So you're gonna create a policy with an unintended consequence that we do sometimes. So, um, so uh, continuing along this path, uh, we want the most viable and robust emerging bioeconomy value chains 
that will be cross-sectoral, and they will eventually, anyways, be global. Um, and we need these new policies for supply chain. And let's put a red line around these guys because um, we're going further. Uh, we're going to change them all the time. Um, we're going to bring in new technologies and new partners. And the products are going to change. We're not going to... Okay, we've made pulp and paper about 100 years now in the way we make them today. And people are still buying that stuff. There's not too many sectors like that. Uh, and, but we have that paradigm a little bit. So the idea that we're going to change always our products is a really big thing. And here's one of the most successful fractionation biorefineries uh, being developed at the moment. It's in, uh, it's in Latvia. Uh, pellets company, actually, a big one uh, called Granule Invest, um, using enzymes technology all the way through uh, a name that uh, Emily knows. And, um, uh, and they got lignin and sugars coming out. And they got a bunch of people there. But look at this list of products they're looking at. So there's a lot of story behind that. But when I do a technology assessment, which I do on the consulting side, we're looking for flexibility in terms of the verticals and the horizontals, in terms of the sub value chains that we can work in, because there's so much uncertainty in the future. There's so many variables around every one of those products. And the ability to change between those products, eventually you're gonna want to focus, but the ability to change between them is the characteristic of robustness for our biorefinery um, strategy. Oh. Time, okay. So um, we got the idea of that one. I'm gonna go to the last one. This is, this is the moment uh, we've all been waiting for. So uh, these are something called clusters. So they have uh, members who are value chain people and services to them. Um, and these are characteristics. There's a group, the Stockholm Business School um, uh, has something called uh, uh, the European Cluster Observatory. And so there's lots of clusters in Europe and they've characterized success and failure. And we built on that and recently done a survey of the bioeconomy clusters in Europe. And so here you've got government related um, support that's needed. Here you've got, um, if you will, business and um, uh, culture innovation, if you want. Here you've got technology development and here you've got other. But these are all the different things, services, we need to think about when we develop a biorefinery strategy. And there's nobody in this room, and there's nobody in any one company that knows about all this stuff. They don't, people don't know what they don't know. It's a really complicated turf. And um, Canada has poor companies looking at developing their biorefinery strategies. So wouldn't it be a great Canadian thing to do to inspire from all those clusters in Europe and create a pan-Canadian cluster, not a BC cluster or a Quebec cluster or something like that, but a pan-Canadian, and bring the best-in-class services in all of those together, and then use that in support of all the different kinds of buyer finance strategies we have, because it is a complicated turf, and companies don't know how to move these things forward and create robust business models. So that's the idea. Here's um, a project that I've talked to Orlando about in the past, hemicellulose extraction uh, in place at a mill now. And here's the basis of some innovation where we've done and are doing with them it, on open innovation. So what, what should we do with these extracted hemicelluloses? And they have <coughs> very interesting biostimulant properties. Biostimulants, they work really well on this crop. They work, really, they work as a biocide on that crop. Um, and Everybody who sells them has their own value proposal and it changes from one entrepreneur to another. So how do you find the right uh, people? So we did an open innovation process involving forest and these biostimulant people, uh, product characteristics, <coughs> excuse me, and properties, preliminary testing, and even financial support for them. <coughs> and raw materials came from the forestry company. And this one here, in return, they did testing. They made their own proposals. <coughs> and they put out their, excuse me, business plan, should they use that value? So companies don't know how to do that well, but we do. And so this is the last example I have, Paper Province, a cluster. Um, you might have heard of it, some of you who work in Lignin. They have Ligno City, which is the um, world's most central point for testing lignans for lignin precipitation in the middle of nowhere, Sweden. And they are the best there is at doing that. And so they've had liquors, <coughs> black liquor sent from comp, pulp, thank you, pulp and paper companies all over the world to test and precipitate their lignin. 
Don't you think they got a good database? And they realized at a certain point, well, that's not going to go far enough. So what they've done is they've brought now all kinds of partners, and they're going to all kinds of market segments to be able to look at that added value proposal from and create, help people create like, robust uh, models. So what's new in the bioeconomy <coughs> is, in this case, these complicated set of services that are needed and competencies that are needed that you need true expertise on the ground uh, to make it successful, and it's really complicated. So I won't go through this, uh, which is stuff you've already heard, um, the uh, conclusions from those three. And I want to do a plug. Um, I'm uh, talking to Professor Rojas about giving a series of presentations, each one of them short, on a study we did called Pfeiffer Futures Project, where we made a hypothetical bioeconomy, and then we moved it across Canada. And I'm, I'm breaking down the study, um, uh, and I'm going to do it in short presentations with lots of discussion. And, um, and our CAN, uh, CFS, supported that work, and we want to vet it. We want your critical analysis. So I hope, anyways, when we uh, decide how we'll do that, uh, that uh, some of you can come and attend several lectures in a row. It's a, it's a full-time commitment for a little bit of time. Okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. It was